appreciate, Brian, your words there, and also that last song, Mitch, it was fantastic. I've never heard that song before. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, that when Brian was talking about before Christ days and uh, Keenan beside me, and he was acknowledging and responding to that. And I think for those of us who realize what God saved us from, there's just that stirring in our soul when we think about the gospel and what Christ did. But when we become complacent and we become what we're going to talk about today, legalistic, and we're good at going through the motions, that doesn't move us anymore because we think we're pretty good moral people. And we've forgotten the difference that God made in our lives. And so I don't care if you've been a Christian for 50 years or five days, the gospel should overwhelm you. It should move us. It should begin to make us just so grateful. And that's the motivation for living the Christian life. And so I want to encourage you today as, as we look at a passage, and, and Paul is going to hit on some of the same subjects again and again. It's easy to think, okay, we've heard that kind of before, but he's building a case, he's making a case, but it all comes back to Jesus, and it all comes back to him. And I just want to use this for an example this morning of how that sometimes we can get kind of off the rails and we can get just, just lose focus in ministry. And, and, and let's bring this home to, to, to the family, to parenting, and, and make it real practical. I mean, you think about, just think, take a verse like uh, Ephesians we took, looked at last series where it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And you think about a, a, a passage of Scripture like that, and you think, how do you approach that with your children? And I want to show you two different approaches that seem, both seem very similar in some ways, but they couldn't be further apart. And I want you to make this personal to you. Is how do you respond to your family, to your children? Which, way, which approach do you, do you take? You know, one way, a sermon or talking to your kids. You know, disobedience to your parents puts you in a dangerous place. Did you know that disobedience to your parents is ultimately disobedience to God? But then, what if you took this angle? But God says disobedience to your parents is, is bad and it's wrong and it's going to lead to all kinds of bad things in your life. And so you need to obey God because if you obey God, that your, the scripture says your life's going to be longer and it's going to be better. All truth, right? And, and you could even point out some verses. I mean, you can pull out 1 Samuel and it says, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. Did you know if you're rebelling, you're like a witch? And, and, you know, and you're telling your kids that. And, and you can bring up some other verses like Romans 1.30. It says, backbiters, haters of God, disrespectful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. And then he puts right in that list, disobedient to parents. And so, kids, you're sitting here and you're thinking, wow, really? That's a pretty serious category that you put me in. You're putting me in a category with uh, people who are uh, haters of God because I'm disobedient to my parents. And, and, and so there's all this focus on, okay, don't do these things. And here, if you want to obey, let me give you three good ways that you can obey your parents, kids. That's one approach that you can take. Another approach you can take would be to say, disobedience to your parents puts you in a dangerous place. Did you know that disobedience to your parents is ultimately disobedience to God? Sounds very similar. But here's the difference. You take a gospel-centered, a heart-centered approach to disobedience. And you tell them that disobedience is ultimately a symptom of something deeper that's going on inside your life and in your heart. And that is that you're not putting Jesus at the center of everything that you do. And disobedience to your parents is ultimately a rebellion against God and the lordship of Jesus, if you're a believer, the lordship of Jesus in your life. And the only hope that we have to be obedient children, the only hope we have to be good parents is ultimately because Jesus working in and through us and brings about then some practical things that we can accomplish in our life. Do you see the difference? It can be very subtle, but it's so big. One is legalism. It says your effort, your work, you do it all. And the other, it says, it's about Christ at work within you. Do we still make effort? Absolutely. But our effort, as Scripture says, it's not through human striving, but it's through God's Spirit that's at work within us. And so as we look at this passage that has to do with legalism, I want you to really think about your life, because this, this first century idea of legalism may not apply to you directly, because maybe you're a believer and you know your all, all your hopes in Jesus. But practically, are you living your life then in a way that's all about your self-effort and about being moral and putting on a good front? 
Because legalism, legalism is working in your own power according to your own rules, ultimately to earn God's favor. And that can be very subtle and it can be very sneaky. And what we do is when we create these expectations that are extra biblical for people, we put on them burdens that they can't take carry. And when we tell our kids, you better obey because it's bad, it's evil that you don't obey. You better start obeying, but we don't direct their hearts to the person who gives them the strength to obey. Then we ultimately set them up for failure as well. So in chapter 2, and we're going to only look through verse 10 today, but in this chapter, we're going to have three pictures of the way that you can live life. You can live, what we're going to talk about today, right behavior with wrong beliefs. You can do the right stuff. You can advocate the right things, but have the wrong belief system pushing you. The second thing is hypocrisy. We're going to look at next week, these last two, right beliefs, but wrong behavior. And the third one will be right belief and right behavior. So today we're going to look at these idea that these Judaizers, these guys who came into the church, for children who haven't been in here, these Judaizers have come in and they're saying, hey, here's some good things you should better do, but their belief system was wrong. And so let's read the scripture here and then we'll get into it. This is Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Paul says, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along with me. I went in response to a revelation and, meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I had preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some of the false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy out on the freedom we had in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Verse 6. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me, an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, who esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship And when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do, do all along. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word that gives us life and gives us truth, God. God, we confess to you that so much of what we do is apart from you, God. We become very, very good at putting on a good religious face, putting on a good Christian smile to pretend like we have it together when inside it just covers up a, a broken spirit, broken situations, hurting hearts here today, God. And I pray that you will draw us to you, God. Help our hearts and our actions to be in faith. And we thank you for your word again that gives us life and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you a little recap of where we've been over the last, uh, or actually last week and through this book, what we're going to be talking about. Remember that when the gospel was delivered, when Jesus died and rose again and left his apostles, most of the people who first came to Christ were Jewish people. And these people were beginning to struggle with this dual identity because they didn't understand exactly, okay, do I continue to obey the laws of Moses? Do I continue to follow the Old Testament Judaism? Or do is this something new? Is, is something different? Am I to celebrate freedom from that law? And these Judaizers, these guys came in saying that these Christians had to convert to Judaism in order to truly be saved, to truly have salvation, to have their sins forgiven. And at the beginning, this wouldn't have mattered much because everybody who came to Christ at the beginning were Jewish people. But as the, 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 the word spread and as people like Paul went out and, and evangelized in these Gentile areas, things became a little trickier. And I realize today is Family Worship Sunday, and I'm not going to go into details on what circumcision is. That's a good thing to explain at home to your children. But it's a key phrase in this passage of Scripture today 
And, and I remember as a kid, when I learned what circumcision was, it blew my mind, like, why was that such a, a big deal? Or really, I mean, for real? Like, why did this become such a controversial issue within the church? And nobody, I don't remember ever explaining that really to me. And here's why. Over the centuries, circumcision had become a marker of Israel's racial identity. And you can go back to Abraham before the law in Genesis chapter 17 when he commanded uh, Abraham and his descendants to circumcise the, the males on the eighth day. And so circumcision was kind of like membership into the covenant family of God. And so what happened was the Judaizers were coming along and they were saying, this is, this is essential stuff, all right? You've got to show what tribe or what group you're with, and this is the way you do this is through circumcision. And so it's easy for us to discount, but you remember, I mean, this is their tradition. This is their culture. This is their way of life that goes back so many years, thousands of years. And so you can understand why this was such a struggle for them. And so Paul is going to insist in this letter that, that being part of God's family, you did not have to have, be circumcised. You did not have to follow the moral um, or the, um, the, the, the commands in the law that had to do with the separation of Israel and being distinct people. And, and so in this passage, he travels to Jerusalem, and he wants to be sure that all the apostles there, all these people in, in Jerusalem, these apostles, we're all on the same page. We're all working together. We all are preaching the same gospel. And so look back in verse 1 and 2 again. He says he went up after 14 years. He goes to Jerusalem, and he presents to them the gospel that he had been preaching among the Gentiles because he says, I don't want to have, to have run or, or, or my race in vain. And so Paul, in this passage, one thing I want to make clear is that he's not this anti-law guy, Okay. Um, he's, he, he says, in fact, in other places that he writes that the law is a good thing. God's law is a good thing. If you look at Romans seven 12, it'll be up on the screen. He says, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. But the, he later clarifies and he tells us that the law has a prop when viewed properly and used properly for what it was intended. That's where the value is found. He tells us this in first Timothy one, eight, we know that the law is good if it is used properly properly. But the problem was people were coming in and their natural tendency was to say, these things are required for salvation. But the function of the law was never to provide salvation, but to convince people of their need for salvation. They looked at God's standard. They looked at his holy law and they realized, you know what? I can't get this holiness myself. I can't measure up. Kind of like, do you like maybe like an MRI? If you go in and if you've ever had an MRI, I mean, it's a pretty intimidating device that you get put into, right? I mean, it's pretty amazing. And the, and the pictures and, and that, that, can, that can be seen and the details that can be seen as a result of an MRI are just inc incredible. But you know what? An MRI, even as impressive as a piece of equipment as it is and as expensive a piece of equipment as it is, it can do nothing to fix whatever problem is there. All it does is reveal, it exposes the problem that you have. It doesn't provide a cure. And that's kind of the way that we need to look at the law. The law exposes our sin. It shows us our disease. It shows us our depravity. It shows God's holiness and how far off we are. And when you look at the law, you can kind of do one of three things. One is you just try harder. And so many people do this. They look at God's law and they think, Wow, that's, that's, it's overwhelming. Let me try. And they make their list, and they put these parameters and boundaries in their life, and it's all about what we talked about, human effort. I can do this. I want to measure up. But what happens? Ultimately, they come to the place where they're just exhausted. They realize that there's no way that they can measure up to God's standard, and they give up in despair and hopelessness. But the way that we should respond is in desperation, and then we turn to Jesus. And we thank Jesus for living up to the standard that we could never live to and paying the debt that we could never pay. And in Christ, and that's why we want to be crystal clear on the gospel here. That's what the gospel is. It says, you don't measure up. You can never obtain God's goodness, no matter how hard you try, no matter how many commands you keep. And that's why we need the cross. Because Jesus says, here's my righteousness in exchange for your sin. 
And he gives us his righteousness and he takes our sin. And so if you're here today and you've been striving and working and hoping to measure up, you're never going to get there. You're never going to get there. That's why we come to Jesus. We fall at the the foot of the cross. That's why we say, Jesus, you're my only hope. And that's what the sinner's prayer, when you pray and ask Christ to come into your heart, as we like to say, that's what it should be. It's not a give me an eternity in heaven necessarily, even though that's part of we get eternal life. But it's an understanding that we can never have a relationship with God. God can't accept us into his family apart from the righteousness and holiness of Jesus. We should never, ever get tired of saying that because it's amazing that people can sit in church week in and week out and go to camps We can go to Christian schools. We can go to good places and hear things, but miss the gospel. It's amazing that people can do that, but it's so simple. But we miss it because our natural tendency is my effort. I can do this, or I can't do it. And it's got to push us to Jesus and put us to the cross, push us to the cross. So Paul says the law is good. It's a good thing, but he says it's not without its fault. Look at Hebrews 8, 7. He says, For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. So he said, The law was subjected to imperfection by God himself, so we might be pointed to Christ, pointed to a better way, pointed to Jesus. And I love what Luther said. Luther said, The law is an usher. It's an usher to lead us to grace. It takes us by the hand and says, Let me show you the way. And so God's pleasure in us is not based upon our performance for him. It's not based upon our effort for him. It's based on what Jesus did for us. And that's so freeing, isn't it? Isn't it amazing that, how freeing that is? But another way, it, it, it can be kind of frustrating. Why? Because you think, well, if, if, if it, you mean I can't do anything to please God? If there's nothing I can do to earn favor with him, is there anything I can do to please him? And the question to that is yes. And, and, and in a way, that's the secret to the Christian life, and we'll see that next week more in detail. But although we can't earn God's favor, Scripture talks about pleasing God. In fact, Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5.9. He says, So we make it our goal to please God, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. So if God's pleasure isn't um, in me isn't based on my performance for him, how can I please him? How do I please him? And we'll talk about that next week. And so Paul goes to Jerusalem because he wants to establish unity with these other apostles, these Jerusalem apostles. And, and, and look in, in the verse, it says that, that he met privately with them. Why did he go and meet privately? I think he was, he was fearful that they may cave in to these Judaizers, these people who were teaching grace and law, and it would undermine everything that Paul was teaching. He wasn't going there to get his gospel validated. He was going there to say, hey, are we preaching the same gospel? We better be. And he wanted to make sure they weren't caving in to these pressures. And from from a human standpoint, we owe so much to Paul. Because Paul stood for the gospel. He stood for truth. He didn't cave in under the pressures. And, you know, so many times, if you have a personality that's a compromiser, sometimes you kind of downplay things, how serious they are. Well, I'm not going to fight that battle because, you know, maybe I can find some common ground here. Maybe we can find some middle ground. But he didn't seek to compromise at all. He was ready to do battle over it. Why? In fact, in Luke verse 4, he calls these people who are opposing him, he calls them false believers because he knew that the gospel they were preaching was really, what he's saying in chapter 1, really no gospel at all. It was a distortion of the truth. And so he says, this is essential. This is, this is bullseye. This is foundational stuff that you have to be right on. And that's why in, in the church, we can, we can um, I, I think it's a, a big umbrella to embrace a lot of different denominations and beliefs. But when it comes to a few critical, important things like salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, it can never, ever be compromised. And that's a hard thing because I think people who grow up in a tradition that it's Christ plus other things, that it's really hard for them to see 
the simplicity of the gospel because it's our human tendency to want to add to and do something. And so I think, I think one thing that's important for parents here on a family worship Sunday is to realize that it's, it, it's critical that we teach our kids, and this is a kind of a bad word in, in modern church, is, is theology, is, is helping them understand the essentials. You don't have to use that word theology, but understanding what the Bible teaches about the, 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 the critical things in Scripture that matter. And sometimes we just fly by that because, you know, it, you know we want to entertain our kids. And if you're a, a kid in here, look at me. It, it's okay to, to be entertained, but you have to realize that when you want to find lasting joy in life, it comes from knowing Christ. And when you find and start to delight in Jesus as you age and get older and you understand that Jesus is so much better than anything else, then you start to be captivated by those things that draw you closer to him. Do you get that? Look, look at me. If your kid's in here, when Jesus is your top desire, then you care about the things of Jesus. And so as you age, sports are great. Video games can be good. TV can be okay. But if we allow these things to take precedent over God and over Jesus, and those things become what we call our idols that we put, then those are the things that are going to entertain us. And so if you find yourself bored with things of God, then you need to do a heart check and think, why am I bored? Because, look, things that you know are useful to you grab your attention, right? Things that you think will be helpful to you will grab your attention. Example, like if you love to play golf and you know that I'm an expert on golf, which I am definitely not, and I say part of this sermon illustration today is I'm going to illustrate to you how to drive a golf ball. And you know that I'm a serious golfer and I'm way better than you and I can drive a golf ball, you're going to hone in, pay attention, take notes. Go, man, I want my game to be better. You see, because you love golf. But somebody else could be sitting here, I'm like, okay, I'm checking out because I have no desire. In fact, I hate golf because my husband goes three hours a weekend and plays. So if Jesus is the center, go back to the beginning illustration, if Jesus is the center of your heart and your heart's desire, then things change in your focus. And so if Jesus isn't captivating your heart, ask yourself, why? What's wrong in your heart? And for children, when you're little, so much of it is upon us as parents to speak to that and help them to, to understand the glorious nature of Christ, that it's not just a list of do's and don'ts, but it's a personal relationship with, with God. And out of that comes a desire to love him and follow him and pursue him and to grow in our relationship with him. So parents on a practical level, sure, it's fine to pick up some devotion books that have a good little story at the beginning, but let's make sure it makes the main thing the main thing, okay? Make sure that it's getting to the heart and the truth, which is the centrality of Jesus in all things and everything. So these Judaizers... Paul says in verse 2, he says, I presented to them the gospel, to the apostles, I'm sorry, to the, I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to make sure that I had not running or had not been running my race in vain. What he's saying is, you know what? I was thinking, I saw Stuart over here, I was thinking about Evan. Evan uh, Beecham was running a race in Tallahassee and the race was very poorly marked. And he told me that like, he, he started running in a complete wrong direction and ran that way for a good long time before he realized that they were going the wrong way. And so he had to turn around, backtrack, and come back to the rest of the group. And, and that's what Paul's picture is he's getting at. He's saying, he, he's saying I don't want to just have, have exerted all this effort, and then you undermine this by saying, okay, sure, we can say circumcision is part of the deal. Or we can say, yeah, you got to keep the law to, and, and Christ both. So he says, I want to make sure that I didn't run my race in vain. And he went to Jerusalem to prove that the gospel he preached was identical to the gospel that they were preaching. And that was the, that was the case in this matter. And then he, he also takes along Titus with him. And Titus is kind of like the test case for really the big issue here, which was circumcision, as we said. Look at verse 3 through uh, 6. He says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, 
even though he was Greek. And so Titus came with him. He said, hey, this guy, he's a believer, he's a Gentile, but he's not going to be circumcised. What do you have to say about that? And so the people in Jerusalem, the apostles in Jerusalem, obviously they discussed it. And we have a whole chapter almost in the Bible that talks about this stuff, Acts chapter 15. And even if this was not necessarily that group, of which most commentators believe, that was the meeting that occurred at this time, but it may not have been. But the point is still the same, that they realized, you know what? It's not about adding anything to the gospel. They, were con- um, they, they could be convinced that Titus was truly a believer, and he did not have to be circumcised. They didn't have to cave in and give in to these people. And so I want to make it clear again. Circumcision itself was not the issue. What was the issue? What is the issue? The issue is, is it Christ plus anything? And here's how I know that, that circumcision wasn't the issue. If you look at Acts 16, 1 through 3, and it'll be up on the screen here, look at this. When Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and, and a believer and whose father was a Greek, the believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along with the journey, so what? So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So in this situation, was he caving in to these Judaizers? Absolutely not. It was for a whole different purpose. Timothy was being circumcised as a Jew, not as a Christian, because circumcision had no connection to his salvation. So what was the point? Why did Paul do this? It goes to what Paul's whole philosophy of ministry. To the Jews, I became a Jew that I might win the Jews. To the Greeks, I became like a Greek. I became all things to all people that I might win some. He's saying, you know what? If Timothy isn't circumcised, we can't go into the synagogues together. He's not allowed into the synagogues to preach to the Jewish people. And so what did he do? He did it for the sake of the gospel, not for anything to add to salvation. And so just like Christian freedom caused Paul to resist Titus to be circumcised. This same freedom allowed him to remove the stumbling block that would hurt Timothy's ability to minister to the people that he was called to minister to. And so he applied that principle to the Jews. I became like a Jew. Isn't that that pretty awesome that we have that passage of Scripture there that shows us that circumcision, it, it can be a good thing, but you know what? It has nothing to do with your relationship with Christ. God doesn't look at you and say, oh, good job. I'll prove you better now because of that. And it seems so silly for us today. But we do that in our own ways. And then he kind of reiterates this. He, 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 again, this, this whole thing about, about Titus not being circumcised and Timothy being circumcised. It's, it's all about Jesus. It's not about methods and it's not about tradition. Look at 7 through 11. He says, he, he says, on the contrary, I recognize that I've been trusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had to the circumcised. So what he's saying is, okay, Titus and I, we're going to the Gentiles. Paul is, or, or, or Peter is going to the Jewish people. And so they realized that they were preaching the same gospel, but they needed to go about it in different ways. And what does that say to us? How does that speak to us? That some people have the gift and ability to communicate to the gospel to one group of people. Some have the gifts and ability to communicate it to another group of people. And here's the modern danger of this. Listen, here's the modern danger. The modern danger is the tendency that people have to water down the offensiveness of the gospel. I mentioned this last week because, oh, we want, to, we want people to come to Christ. So we're not going to say the offensive things because we want them to come and to know Christ. But you can't come to Christ without the offensive things. But on the flip side of that is you have to be willing to break down man-made traditions and barriers in order for people to hear the gospel. You can't allow your hang-ups, your traditions that are extra-biblical, your legalism to be a stumbling block for people coming to the gospel. And we're all guilty of that because we all, regardless of how current or up-to-date or modern you are, you still have your traditions, and we have all have our traditions and things that we prefer and like. And the problem becomes is when we allow these things to become non-negotiable, and they basically create a system of legalism. You're saying real Christians do things this way. Real Christians sing music this way. Real Christians look this way. They dress this way. They act this way. And you, become, you make all these man-made rules up, 
and create barriers for people to come to Christ. So you see the extremes? The extremes is, oh, I'm not going to say anything about the gospel, the offensive stuff of the gospel, because I don't want people to you know, freak out about that. We can kind of work them into that later. But then the flip side of that is creating all these things that cause people not to come to Christ that have nothing to do with Scripture and the Bible. And so our job is to what? Is to share Christ, to give Christ. And why do we do that? Because of love for people. Love for people. And when we love our traditions more than we love people, we become legalistic. When we love our church more than we love people, we become legalistic. Legalism just seeps into our life so subtly. And we've got to guard against it. It's our natural tendency. And then look at verse 10. Finishes this section off by says, And they, the Jerusalem apostles, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. In Jerusalem, the, uh, the conditions were very bad. They were very dire because you had people coming to Christ, and as a result of coming into Christ, they were in this system that was you know, completely Judaism, and so they couldn't find jobs. They were fired from their jobs. They found themselves very poor and in need. And he's saying, hey, we're in this together. We share with one another. Part of the ethics of Christ is this idea that, that we are willing to open our, our hearts, our homes, our pocketbooks for one another. And so he says, we need to meet, help these people meet their tangible needs there in Jerusalem. And, just in, in, and for us, practically, um, that has to do with just not only the poor among us, but the poor in our community Scripture says so much about the poor. And it's so hard sometimes to know who really needs help, right? I mean, I, had a, I, I got a text yesterday. Should I help this person? You know, they're here on, on the campus. What do I do? And those situations are so difficult to deal with. But it doesn't remove the responsibility that we have to make an effort to help those who are poor in, in our society, in our community. And one way that we've created to help in that, in that aspect is, actually, you see it back here this morning on your way out, the Jesus Is board. And what this is, we talked a little bit about it, but we've rolled it out this morning because it, it shows you opportunities in our community to love like Jesus in very practical ways. And look, we don't do those things so we can earn favor before God. Oh, man, I, I spent three hours at the women's shelter. God, aren't you so pleased with me? God, I, I, I went down to the refinery and, and helped out. God, aren't you, aren't you happy that I'm doing a good job here? We don't do it to earn God's favor. But we lo- do it because we love people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And God said, the poor, love the poor. He loved the poor. He loved the down and out in our society. And so it's a great practical tool to see different ways that you can be involved in different things in the community and connect to those. And so I encourage you to see these opportunities, listen, as, a, as an opportunity to share Christ. Because that's what liberalism does. It just says, let me go and serve your social need, but it doesn't say anything about Jesus and doesn't point them to Christ. That's where that we use these things as opportunities to share Christ, to, do, to go to whatever extent or, or, or place necessary and to, to care and minister to give us an opportunity to make Christ known. And so today our situation may not be one of circumcision or Jewish law, but we all think struggle with things that we want to do to earn God's favor. And we have a tendency to want to look on the outside. Just like Samuel said, what did he say? He said, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And we have a tendency sometimes to look at somebody who says the right things and has the right look about them and dresses the right way, and we think, well, pff, that's, that, that's a great Christian right there. But inside, we don't know what kind of spiritual laziness and sloth and behaviors that are covered up. And so what do we do? What do we do? We don't quit doing the good things. You know, you don't say, well, I'm going to wait till my heart's right before I do these spiritual disciplines. That's a totally wrong way to look at it. We say, God, help these spiritual disciplines, church attendance, youth group, children's ministry, reading my Bible, praying. God, help all these things to be activities that draw me in closer to you and to a relationship with you 
and to allow you to become Lord of my life and to put you on the throne of my life where you are the worshiped more than anything else. So where does your religious expertise cover up your inner sloth, your emptiness, and your improper motives? Let me ask you that. Think about that personally for you. Where does your religious expertise, the things that you can just spout out and say so easily, the things that you're so good at, you can quote scripture left and right because you've been an insider for so long. But inside, you know it's not the reality. Your belief is either you're trying to earn God or you're doing it out of duty. And your heart and your actions don't match up. Give you these five things and then we're done. Signs of a legalistic spirit. Lack of joy. Unwillingness to enter into transparent, authentic community with another believer. What I mean by that, we use the word accountability sometimes. But you don't want anybody to see there what's in there because you've got a pretty good facade set out here where you, where you pretend like everything's good and okay. And that would require you to, to expose your motives and be honest about what's really going on inside. What about this one? People who are legalistic, they're very critical and they're unloving toward others. They find fault. There's a problem with them. There's a problem with that. There's a problem with that, that system, that church. We become obsessive toward outward standards. We notice all those things and we point them out. The outward standards, those things that we set up as being from God that aren't. And we become bondage in bondage to tradition. We want things our way, do it the way that we want to do it. And in parenting, as we talked about, this can be, come, just, I want my kid to be a good kid and, and, and have that image that portrays a good moral kid. And kind of like Brian, you know, talked about drinking and stuff. Oh, my kid doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't sleep around. All right. If, they, if I could make it through high school and college with those three things, then I've done a pretty good job. But we sold ourselves short because God's not pleased with just a don't do list. God wants what? The heart. He wants the heart. So what's the cure for legalism? It's to run to Jesus. It's to run to Jesus. When we realize what a mess, mess our life is, apart from Jesus, we're not going to create rules and standards for other people because we're going to be so consumed with, you know what, Jesus, I fall so short of your goodness and your grace. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Run to Jesus. Look to Jesus. How about you? Most people here, you come to church almost every Sunday. We've got the outward thing down. But what's pushing that? What's motivating you? Don't say, well, I'm not coming to church because my motives are wrong. No, what you do is you look at your heart and you expose it to God. Say, God, I lack the joy of my salvation. I do have a critical spirit, constantly cutting people down. I'm setting standards that nobody could keep, including myself. God, I confess that I'm a legalist and I need you. I need you, Jesus. Jesus isn't just somebody we run to for salvation. It's the way that we live our lives by grace, through faith, not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. And that's the same way that we live the Christian life. Let's pray. Father God, we know that we're all guilty at some level, many levels of putting on a good outward appearance, yet our motives are impure, that we're motivated by trying to please you or by fear of you and fear that you might punish us or strike us with a disease and all these wrong thoughts about you that we have, God. And we thank you for the truth that we sang, that your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on us, God. We thank you 
that we've been fully accepted because of Jesus. There's nothing we can do to earn your favor. And God, we thank you for that full acceptance. God, I pray for those here who have experienced a lot of difficulties in in this world and in their human relationships, that they have experienced love that's based upon performance and they've they've experienced spouses running out on them and um, kids who have have abandoned them and and so many difficult things and it reflects upon their ability to see you in, in the right light because they do have a fear and that same fear that you, if, you, if they don't do what you tell them to do and you command them that you're, that you're going to be running out on them and, and deserting them, God. And we thank you that that's not true, that that's a lie of Satan. And that in the cross, we're fully loved and we're fully accepted. And I pray that you'll help us to build our lives upon that. God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.